If you would, open your Bibles for uh, the fourth time as we're in a section of Scripture here on walking with God in the dark when difficult times and seasons comes. Lots of times we can't see clearly. We don't know how to pray effectively. We don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. We don't know how to respond. We just seem to be in a dark situation. Life can bring times of light, and life can bring times of darkness. So if you open your Bibles to 1 Kings 19, we spent um, quite a bit of time in chapter 18 last week in that incredible section of Scripture where the God of um, Elijah is calling down fire uh, from heaven to the altar on Mount Car- Carmel, and uh, the gods of Baal are praying as well, and there's nothing happening, and the God who answers by fire is the God who's going to be the God that Elijah is going to continue to serve. And by the way, we still serve that same God today, right? And we learned last week that if your God cannot set fire to wet wood, you need a new God. So those kind of things are in there. And we preach that section because it's a continuation, not just because 19 follows 18, but we preach that section because of the seeming discouragement, the despondency, the desperation, the hard times, just lots of negative things going on in Elijah's, Elisha's life, Elijah's life, and Elisha too. He comes into the picture in this section too as well. But trying to sort through some of that. So today when I start talking about things like the, uh, the depression that we go through, there's a younger generation that hears the word depression, and they think about chemical imbalanced things. They think about hard times as far as what they know. But I speak to some folks even in this room, when I speak about depression, you don't think about that type of depression. You think about the Great Depression. You think about hard times. You think about having to hold on to things because you didn't know what tomorrow would bring, and you knew God held tomorrow, but you just didn't know how much God was going to show you of tomorrow today. I say all that to say, I put this together to let us work through, because I want to start with this idea of this great depression and then move it down toward how it parallels with some of the symptoms that we even have today when we talk about darkness and walking in desperate situations. In the Franklin D. Roosevelt Library, you'll find this. That the Great Depression was the worst economic turndown in U.S. history. It, it began in 1929 and did not subside until the end of the 1930s. And again, people in this room know that. A severe worldwide economic disintegration symbolized in the United States by the stock market crash on Black Thursday, October 24, 1929. The cause of the Great Depression were many and varied reasons, but the impact was visible across the entire country. By the time FDR was inaugurated president on March the 4th of 33, the banking system had collapsed. Nearly 25% of labor force was unemployed. Prices and productivity had fallen to one-third of their 1929 levels. Now, I could have went on giving historical facts that all of you can search and find on your own. That wasn't the purpose. The purpose is to show some parallels that's even happening today. We've had banks to close in the last week. We've got all kinds of investors telling us so many different things. We've got gold conversations going on. We've got silver conversations going, got going on. We've got Bitcoin conversations going on. People are just asking from the financial world, what are some good decisions? What do we do? Lots of things are being talked about. So you've got that type of great depression that's filtered through lots of cooler talk at work, students talking about it at school and history, and then lots of us like, I don't know that I understand even what I was going on. And then through all of that, you got a person probably in our worship center this morning, you got more than a few people living in your cul-de-sacs and your neighborhoods at home, and even your family members that are dealing with a different type of depression. Their depression is great as well. Their depression is not controlling the country, so to speak, but their depression is controlling them. Their depression is allowing them to see things through, through rose-tinted glasses. They, they watch people talk, and they can think they're talking about them because they're sorry and so negative-based. They don't know. And the truth is, they're not talking about them at all. They're just talking about something outside. But yet, mentally, they tell themselves, they're talking about me. And so the enemy is louder in the child of God's life in depressive times than God is, and that's wrong. It's just wrong. Depression, it happens to lots of us. 
I mean, to stop. Let's, let's, here's how we can tell how, how honest and how real and how good the service might could get. Is there anybody in the room be honest enough to say you've dealt with depression before? Would you raise your hand? That's, that's a lot of us. Um, I would say if you didn't raise your hand, you're either afraid to tell the truth or you're a child and you maybe just don't know what it is yet, even though some children, remember, 7 to 25, deal with it all the time. So what I want to do is free us all up and understand depression is not a card saying that you're a lost man or a lost woman. God's people do get dis- discouraged. The Bible is filled with people of God, men and women, who are great servants and giants of God who deal with depression. We're going to talk about one of them, obviously, today. But I'm of deep conviction that all of us will face periods of depression, loneliness, great discouragement through our lifetime. We rub shoulders every day, we do, with people who are desperate, hurting, and lonely. Desperation, discouragement is all part of the fall. It's part of the human condition. And it does not, I want to say it again, it does not, never has, never will, discriminate between a lost man and a saved man. It will visit your house that God lives in, and it will visit your house if God does not live in that house. He'll visit your job. He'll visit somebody else's job. It does not discriminate. It visits every one of the people that God created. Now, the Bible doesn't use the word depression a lot per se. Now, it uses a lot of synonyms and even anonyms that describe it and walk around it, except only in the Bible translations that are different. You'll find words such as downcast, brokenhearted, troubled, miserable, despairing, mourning, and others that lead you into the vernacular of a discouraged person. But a verse that has intrigued me for years, it's in the Proverbs, so you should know that I've memorized a lot of those verses like I've challenged you to do through the years because I read one a a day. But uh, on the 12th day of every month, I read this one in verse 25, anxiety in a heart brings what? Depression. All right, so let's back up. Anxiety. What's anxiety? What's, what's anxiety? What is anxiety? You scared? You worried? I'm hearing a lot of things. You're anxious about something. Anxious about, anxious, what you anxious about? This ain't a therapy class, but I'm going to ask you anyway. What you anxious about? All us Bama fans ain't got to be anxious about basketball no more. It's over. We've gone back. It's over. Waiting on the fall. So what you anxious about? I'm sorry? The unknown. He's worried because he ain't got nothing to worry about. I just diagnosed Doc. So what you worried about? Because, I'm sorry? Parenting. That's a valid concern right there. Yeah, that's a valid concern. So my point is this. We get anxious. And Solomon, the wisest of all, said anxiety, anxiousness, without parallel, brings what? Depression. But a good word from me, from you, from God's people, a good word makes that same depressed heart glad. That verse has just meant a lot to me through the years. If you live by that verse, it'll dictate who you hang with. It'll dictate who you don't need to hang with. And it'll tell us when we're out of bounds because worry is a sin. Anxiousness in my heart over long periods of time is a sin for me and for you. Throughout the Bible, though, there are very several stories about godly influential men and women who faced and struggled and battled dark times in their life. The Psalms are filled with them. Hopeless situations, depression. Listen, though, to a few outside of the Psalms and the characters that face them, because most likely we'll all know all these iconic names and figures, but at the same time, we may have forgotten some of the struggles they went through. For example, Psalm 38 and 4, David says this, For my iniquities have gone all over my head. Like a heavy burden they are on me. Life is too heavy, heavy for me. Elijah in chapter 19, verse 4, today's text says this, Oh Lord, take my life from me, for I'm no better than my father's. Well, whoever said he was, 
He's borrowing trouble now that he don't need to borrow. Nobody ever asked him to be better than anybody. But yet, we'll get into it in a minute, there's somebody on his heels that's causing him to feel this way. Jonah, remember him? Prophet with an attitude. Jonah 4, verse 3 says, Therefore now, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. There's two guys right in a row. Elijah and Jonah wants to die. Hardness and darkness and hard times, depressive situations is so bad on them that they just want to end their lives. Job 3, verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? He's lived to the point to where he doesn't understand why this calamity has happened to him. He's lost everything. You know the story. Or you should know the story. He's lost everything he's ever owned, even his children. And he's got some friends, if you could call them that, that kept showing up in his life, accusing him of, of doing everything that was right, doing everything that was wrong. And the reason he's suffering is because he's done something bad before God, and God's punished him for it. So therefore, he wants to die. And what about Moses, the great lawgiver, in Exodus 32, 32? But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. He had heaviness in his heart for a different reason, for, for the people of God. In other words, he was a lot like Paul. If anybody could go to hell, let it be him, not let it be our people. Then you remember Jeremiah in chapter 20, verse 18? Why did I even come out of my mother's womb? To, to see all this toil and to see all this sorrow and spend my days in shame. That's a depressed man. That's a man with some heaviness. That's a man that's got some things going on in his life that would have to read the whole account to even begin to know. And then you remember in Isaiah 53 when he spoke of the pr prophetic word of Jesus. He would be despised, chapter 53. He would be rejected. He would be a man of great sorrow. Jesus would be a man acquainted with much grief. And as one from whom men would hide their faces, he was despised because they couldn't even recognize him. He had been beaten. As he was on the Villa Della Rosa up the way of sorrows, those going to Israel with us in June, we'll walk that path. Um, it's incredible to know the burden that had been placed upon him. Not just the scourging, that was one thing, but it was the burden that he was carrying for the sins of the world. What do all these scriptures, what does all these men have in common? They all represent men that are depressed. And these are some, these are some of God's heroes. So let's get over the fact that you can't be a man of God or a woman of God if you're depressed because some of God's greatest choices of servants were men who dealt with depression. Moses, David, Jonah, Job, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and yes, even our Lord, they all faced depression and all faced discouraging times in their lives. Let me transition a second and ask a question. Would it shock you if I were to tell you that in my 29 plus years of being your pastor, I've had some times of deep darkness? Because I have. I've had some times of deep darkness over chapters of our church, chapters of some families' lives, some, some situations to where as your shepherd, I was helping you bear burdens, as Galatians chapter 6 tells me I should, and sometimes those burdens would get heavy. Any shepherd that will not help his sheep carry burdens is a shepherd you don't need. Amen? And every church has shepherds to help them through all kinds of things in their lives. And um, every shepherd's always on duty. There'll be times the shepherd will have to make choices between these sheep and his own sheep. And there's balance and great wisdom that has to be placed in that. And it can get out of hand quickly. And when you get it out of hand quickly, and even sometimes when you keep it in balance, the weight of that, the depressing situations that you begin to feel in that have a hold on you. So whether you're Tim Anderson or Caleb Gooch, or any other person we have here as a staff member, or the next thousand pastors you can line up in here, they're lying to you if they tell you that depression is not part of their life from time to time. It's all there. Let me ask you another question. Take me out of it for a minute. We've all heard the name Charles Spurgeon, right? Not a bad guy. One of the greatest preachers to ever preach, to ever write. To ever be at Moody, incredible guy to work with D.O. Moody. Would you be surprised to learn that he dealt with depression the majority of his ministry? 
the majority of it. History tells us that he faced depression. Physically, he wasn't a healthy man. He, he dealt with what we know today to be, to be gout. And gout, if you've ever had it, thank God I hadn't. I know that could change tomorrow. But those of you that have, I've talked to many of you that have, it's a very painful, painful situation. But this disease caused him much grief, much depression throughout his lifetime. 1857, one Sunday morning, he stands to preach. The famous British preacher Spurgeon shocked his over 5,000 parishioners that day when he stood up in Music Hall, Royal, Royal Surrey Gardens, to begin a sermon from Isaiah 41. And they all looked at the text, but this is how he began his sermon that day. Congregation, I have to speak to myself today. And whilst I shall be endeavoring to encourage those who are distressed and downhearted, I shall be preaching, first of all, to myself. For I need something which shall cheer me up, my heart. Why? Why, I cannot tell. Wherefore, I do not know. But I have a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. And by the way, if you'll trace that back to 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul where he's quoting Paul here, you'll understand that person was not just, that, that situation was not just some thorn off a rose bush in the spring or fall time. It was a person. He was referring to a person in the church, just like Paul was referring to a person in the Corinthian church that was there by Satan as a shaft, not some little thorn, but a, a, a pale, a shaft to otherwise impale his prideful flesh each and every day to keep him humble. And God chose not to remove it. In every church, God chooses to remove, remove some things, some people, and some things, some things he chooses not to remove. And I don't know why that happens, but that's why he's God and we're not. He's sovereign and we're not. But he goes on to say, I have a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. And then he says, my soul is cast down within me. I feel as if I had rather die than to live. All that God hath done by me seems to be forgotten. And my spirit flags and my breaks. God, I need your prayers. Truth is, we don't just think about God's preachers and prophets dealing with depression like we do. But again, they do. Spurgeon went on to say he wrote an article in his day that was called The Minister's Fainting Fits. You have to say that slow or you'll say something else. He, said, he, he says this in the article. Knowing by most painful experiences what deep depression of spirit means... Being visited therewith at seasons by no means few and far between, I thought it might be consolatory to some of my brethren if I gave my thoughts thereon that younger men might not fancy that some strange thing that happened to them when they became for a season possessed by melancholy. And that sadder men might know that, upon, that one upon whom the sun has shone right joy, joyously did not always walk in the light." He went on to say in the article this, too. Through our, though our trials may come from the world, the flesh, and the devil, they are overruled and ordained by God, who treats them as an important part of our new life in Christ. For a start, we simply could not be like Christ if we were not treated like Him, or if we did not have a hard life or if we have a life of ease, which he had, and when he had such a life of pain. And I like this question. Do you expect to be crowned with gold when he was crowned with thorns? Shall lilies grow for you where briars grew for him? 1 Kings 18 and 1 Kings 19 introduces us to four iconic personalities. My goal today is to not to exegete this whole chapter. It wasn't my goal last week to exegete all of 18. My goal is to pull the, the, a lot of the meat, a lot of the fruit out of here, make application to it, and allow it to help us understand how we can make better decisions that will lead to, to lightheartedness rather than heavyheartedness, to cause us... To, to have, see some applicational ways that we can make better decisions instead of decisions that are not so good. So in this section, we have the king, we have Ahab, we have Jezebel, we have Elijah, and we have God. So you have four iconic 
pictures here, and you have some lessons here. The first one here is King Ahab. Man, he was such a good man. If there ever was, y'all ready for this, ladies? If there ever was a hand-pecked husband, it was him. If there ever was a dude that needed to be a man, it was him. Whatever Jezebel wanted, he did. Because if he didn't, he might not be alive tomorrow. He had to go to sleep sometime, and he recognized that. So he's married to Jezebel. He's the classic compromising husband, if you would, a lot like Obadiah, just a little bit different. But yet he had this wife, this woman, who was a very condescending, dominating wife. Pick it up with me in verse 1, chapter 19. King Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Now, you have no idea what that just said. You have no idea what that just means. King, King Ahab told Jezebel. Now, he's not telling her to inform her. He's telling her because he knows she will do something about it where he didn't. King Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed, Lord says, all the prophets with the sword. You remember back in 18 when he killed all of Baal's prophets? Jezebel loved to rule. She loved to reign. And she loved to get on a tyrant, if you would. So look at verse 2. She loved to take over. Well, when she heard it, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying this. I, could you imagine if it had been in our world today, she would just text him. Send him, a, send him a quick text. I don't think she would have called him. I just think she would have sent him a hot text. So may the gods do to me, and more also, more also, if I do not make your life the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Can I translate that for you? Can I give you the Timothy Wayne Anderson version of that? You toast, dude. You going to heaven or hell? Because she's going to have your hide. Now, I'd say it a different way if it was a men's conference, but I, I'm not. I'm chill out. I'm not. I'm going to leave it like that. But bottom line is, she sent him a message. You crossed one woman too many. Now, you've got to keep, keep in your mind what's going on here, how it's translating, how it's happening. All the while this is happening, Elijah is getting afraid. He's absolutely fearing what's, worse, what's going to happen. So, in other words, she told him that by this time tomorrow, she gave him 24 hours and he would be dead. Charles Swindoll said about this section, Jezebel fits to a T. I love how he said this. The image of a domineering wife. First, she took quickly matters into her own hands. Secondly, she did her, she did her husband's job her own way. Third, she turned to intimidation and schemes when she saw her weak, willed husband crumbling under pressure. As I told you last week, they're Bonnie and Clyde. They're, 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 just, they're just two wimpy type people. Ken and Barbie, I called them. But it was evil. Here's what you see. It was evil married to weakness. She was evil. He was weak. So it was evil married to, weak, to, to weakness. And so therefore, we have a bad, bad combination. So look at verse 3. And if you would, I just want you to see the first four words here. 1 Kings 19, depending on what, what, what tr translation you have, mine's from the, from the English Standard Version. Here's what my Bible says. Then he was afraid. When he got the message, when he flipped his phone up, saw what she'd text him, he got afraid. Now, this is amazing to me. And, and most of us know the story, but for those of us that may not, it's worth repeating. He just stood back in chapter 18 against all the gods of Baal. He just stood against the monarch. He just stood against all odds being against him. He just stood at Mount Carmel. He just dug a tr trench around the altar. He put water in it before he put the bulls in it. He made it so impossible for God to do something, but God did it anyway. God showed up, showed out, and now he's afraid. But let's not be too hard on him. Because some of us have done the same thing. Who are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Who are you afraid of? What doctor's report are you fearing you're getting next? What situation is looming that's got you fearful? That'll have you literally depressed if you keep on. 
He's just called down fire from heaven. He's just literally displayed great courage in the face of great odds. But this woman named Jezebel got the best of him. And verse 3 tells us, then now he is afraid. But let's give Elijah a little credit. Can we give Elijah a little credit? Say, Pastor, how would you give him a little credit? I've met some bad women too in my life, haven't y'all? You never met a Jezebel? Have you ever met a Jezebel? Ladies, if you ever get called one, that ain't a compliment. That ain't a compliment. Discouragement, here's what I want us to hear. Discouragement and depression can happen overnight. Discouragement, a downhardened heart, depression can happen overnight. So let's get into the text and let me give some applicational points here um, because I don't want to be long. Here's what I want you to see. Elijah starts pouting and in his pouting, he makes many mistakes. And I promise you, if you will ask the Lord to help you like I've asked him to help me, and if you will just get the restaurant out of your mind for a little while, get the afternoon out of your mind for a little while, and concentrate on this text with me for the next 10 minutes or so, I promise you, there's some parallels, some applicational points that we can pull out of this that will help us from getting heavy-hearted in despair and under the weights that the enemy wants you under, but yet you don't have to be under. Ready to go? Let's try them. Number one. What did he do? He failed to consider the source of his threat. And of course, he's a mean woman, but he forgot what happened back in chapter 18. Of course, she's a wicked woman, but he forgot to consider the source of his threat. I mean, there's, there's just nothing for him to be afraid of here, but yet he is. Swindoll says it again this way. This threat hadn't come from God. That's enough said right there, right? If God be for you, who can be against you? So right now, what are you afraid of that God's not got anything to do with? And why are you afraid if God's not sent you the fear? Now, if God sent you the fear, you better be afraid. But if God hadn't sent it, that means God's still got victory for you. The threat hadn't come from God. It had come from an unbelieving, carnal human being who had lived her godless life light years away from the things of God. If Elijah had been thinking clearly and realistically, he would have realized this. His good judgment, as well as his faith, would have provided the kind of self-talk to himself that have went like this. Hey, my God's in control here. Hey, my God just did something incredible back in chapter 18. Why am I afraid of this lady? But that's not what he did. But his God would have said, don't give a second chance to her threats. Trust me like you trusted me just a day ago. And don't give in to the intimidation and the fear that she wants you to give in to. Now, here's a question I have for myself, for you, for all of us. Do you ever allow your emotions to control you? You're lying if you say no. I don't care how strong you are. All of us at times have been guilty of our emotions and our fears. And our minds to think rather than what the facts say. Everybody that's talking in a room that you look at that you think is talking about you ain't talking about you. But yet you got something so perverted in here, you think everybody's got it out for you. That's just not true, but that's what the enemy says. And you're already behind the eight ball, proverbially, when you're hearing the voice of the devil longer than you, louder than you hear the voice of God. If Elijah had been thinking clearly and realistically, he would have realized this. Do you ever allow this to happen? When the devil uses his people to hurt you, always consider the source. I want you to let that sink in. When the devil allows his people to hurt you, don't think God did that. Yes, God's sovereign. He can control. But it was the devil's people that did it. And that's what's happening to Elijah. It's the devil's people that's after him, not God. Elijah faced or failed to look behind the threat and see that it was Jezebel that was driving the entire thing. She was a big bluff. And he wouldn't know it, true or false, because he wasn't going to slow down long enough till he got under the broom tree. And then he starts pouting even further when he gets there. So he failed to consider the source of his threat. Secondly, Here's what we do too. He left behind his friend and his servant. 
He took off running. If you go back to chapter 18, I'm not going to, but you could read the latter part of it. And when they start heading back into Jezreel, he outruns the chariot. Elijah outruns the horse because of what all was going on in his heart and in his mind. Look at verse 3 of chapter 19. He left his friend and his servant behind. Then he was afraid. Now, when we are running in fear, number one, you're running in the wrong direction, but also you also run not paying attention, right? He was afraid. He arose and ran for his life. Make no mistake about it. He knew she wanted to kill him. He ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And notice what he did. He had a friend there. He had a servant there. The Bible leaves us nothing to wonder about it. He left him there. He left him there. Discouraged people are lonely people. In this room of the hundreds of people that are in here, and this is a low Sunday because of spring break, but even on this Sunday, there's hundreds of people here. Did you know that you can be very lonely, dried up, shriveling, about to die in a crowd? You can hide in a crowd. You can hide the reality of who you are, what you're really going through. Zig Ziglar, who's in heaven now, used to always say, it's lonely at the top. For years, here's what y'all have said to me. You'd say, Pastor, you're so busy. Well, I am, but I'm never too busy for encouragement. I'm never too busy, nobody else. Your next pastor will never be too busy for prayer. He'll never be too busy for you to call him up and encourage him. You're never too busy for that. None of us are. Lonely people are discouraged people. And when you leave your friends behind, I promise you, you're on the way and the road to discouragement. Don't ever try to deal with something in isolation. It just will not work. So it's lonely out there like that. John Baker, I love how he said this, talking about the the tree, the juniper tree. It's called a broom tree. They would use these branches to actually sweep things with. So it's got its name. The juniper tree or or broom tree deep in the wilderness has room for only one person underneath it. When you you go to pouting like Elijah was pouting, and you start running the way he was running, here's a man of God now. We're talking about a Moses-type guy. He's on the run. He's pouting. He's on the run. He's, he's forgotten where the source of his problems are coming from. Then he left his friend behind. He's, he's wanting to just endure it on his own. All of a sudden, he's in more trouble now than he was when he started out. Beneath the barren branches of discouragement and loneliness, there's little shade. Elijah should have stayed with the friend who would have walked with him, encouraged him, and not allowed him to have such a deep pity party. I'm going to say something that's, that indicts me. Sherry already knows it. And um, I just want you to know that I, I, I'm as sinful as you are. It was this week. I was pouting. I was complaining about something. And she let me get it all out. And she looked at me. And she said, that's enough. Well, it made me so mad. I just left the couch. I just got up. I went outside and returned my phone calls. But later on, I came back to her, and I thanked her. I said, I needed what you said. Now, I didn't quite need it as harsh as you made it. (laughs) But nevertheless, I got it. But she was right. I was pouting. I was justifying my feelings. And she looked at me and she said, you got to let it go. I've let it go. You've got to let it go. And I thanked her then and I thank her again today. Don't ever leave the people who love you. Don't wander too far from the people who will drag you out of the hole or better yet, keep you from getting into the hole. Don't get by yourself when you're going through hard times. Stay around people who love you and care for you. And now let me lift the plow up and say this to all of us. You may not be discouraged today, 
But if you're walking with the Lord, I believe this. I really believe this. I've built my entire ministry off this principle I'm fixing to tell you. If I'm not discouraged right now, I know there are other people that are, so I ask God to reveal to me who they are so I can get involved in their lives. I begin to pray. I look at our pastoral care ministry. I look at all things around me that would give me information, and I make deductions, and I say, I know they're going through a hard time. They need encouraging. They need prayer. They need a pat on the back. They need a hug. They need somebody showing up. Are you willing to do that for people that need you? Because if you're not, come in close. If you're not, then you got no right to gripe when nobody comes to you. If you're not going to inconvenience yourself to go out of your way to do something you really don't have time to do, then you have no right to complain when you need someone to walk into your life, but yet they got busyness going on and they don't take the time to call you. If God's people don't care for God's people, who do you think will? So it's just something to think about. Every time we feel depressed and discouraged in our lives, we can feel all alone. And truth is, there's a lot of people who feel alone in today's world. That's why we better keep cultivating our marriages. That's why we better keep cultivating our children, our grandchildren, because they face a lot of things as well. Thirdly, he had just come off a fresh victory. He had just come off a fresh victory. Our most vulnerable moments usually happen right after our Mount Carmel's. Our most tragic times usually come off right off our greatest victories. But at this point, Mount Carmel was just a faint memory to Elijah. Let me read what happened as we closed last week. I do want to go back and remind us his energy and emotions were now in a downward spiral. But if you go back to chapter 18, look at verse 38 real quickly. Let me read two or three verses here before I give you the last couple of applicational points. Verse 38, 1 Kings 18, then the fire, he, he's off a fresh victory. Here, here's what it was. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. And the wood and the stones and the dust had licked up the water that were in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Because the gods of Baal had not responded the way God of Jehovah did. And Jehovah Jireh did. Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed all of them there. But Elijah had already forgotten the victory that God gave him on Mount Carmel. Is it fair enough to ask that same question about all of us? Do we have a tendency to forget what God's done in our past? When we go through a, a really difficult, hard-pressing time, whether it's health, finances, or whatever it may be, relationships, all of the above, are we quick and prone to forget what God did in the past that causes us to not have clear vision of what He can do in the present and wants to do in the future? He had already forgotten. And we all tend to forget the victories that we're all facing when God's given us one in the past. Why do you think the children, of the, the people of Israel laid 12 stones in the Jordan? They wanted their children to remember that God had been good to them there. They wanted it to be a place of memory, and those 12 stones was supposed to have marked that. Then number four, he was physically and emotionally exhausted. I touched a little bit of this last week. I made the statement last week, don't, don't, don't make big decisions when you're discouraged. James Dobson says this, sometimes instead of quitting, we just need a nap. How many of you know naps can be spiritual? We, 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 bunch of stuff. Now, and by the way, get your nap on Saturday, not on Sunday at 11 o'clock when I'm in here preaching. I'm going to start charging y'all for the sleep I'm giving y'all. Wake up, man. Come on. Sometimes we just need to rest, right? Spurgeon, again, in his booklet, The Minister's Fainting Fits, said this. Excess of joy or excitement must be paid for by subsequent depressions. While the trials last, the strength is equal to the emergency. But when it's over, natural weakness claims the right to show itself. 
Let no man who looks for ease of mind, oh, this is incredible. Let no man who looks for ease of mind and seeks the quietude of life enter the ministry. For if he does, he will flee from it quickly in disgust. There's pressures in ministry. You read 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 11, and 12, and I promise you, there were days Paul wanted to quit. It's all about pain for him. There was a lot of heaviness there. Then number five, where he was is he was absorbed in self-pity. Let's be honest. Has anybody ever felt sorry for themselves? Just a little too long? Look at verse 4, 1 Kings 19. But he himself went a day's journey. Now, he leaves from there and goes another day's journey into the woods, into the wilderness. And he came and he sat down under a juniper broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, Is enough now, O Lord, take my life from me, for I'm no better than my father's. Well, we've said it before, but let's just make it really clear that we all understand. He did not want to die. Because if he had wanted to die, all he had to do was stop, and Jezebel would have took care of that for him. But the reason he keeps running in the wilderness is because he don't want Jezebel to catch him. So let's be really clear. He does not want to die. He's just wallowing in self-pity. And this is Elijah. If Moses, Elijah, and Jeremiah can get to this depth, rest assured Tim Anderson can. Rest assured you can. You are not all that strong. I promise you the enemy knows what little bit it takes to discourage you. He knows what little bit to walk before you to depress you. He knows what kind of memory lapse you can have to go to the past that will wreck your day to day. So we have to move forward and not lay there the way he did. Whoever said he was better than his father's. Self-pity is a terrible emotion for me, for you, for all of us. Let me tell you what else I'll do in my last statement. Self-pity will lie to you. Why will it lie to me, Pastor? Because it's from hell. It's from its father, the devil, John 8, 44. He was a liar from the beginning. He abode never in the truth. And the Bible says he cannot do anything but lie. And God, on the other hand, can do nothing but tell the truth. He's impeccable. Titus 1-2 says literally, God who promised before the world began could and who could never lie. I'm going to ask that every head be bowed. Take a moment here. Not going to give hard invitation, but going to give one. I'm going to give one from the standpoint of maybe there's more than just a handful of folks in here this morning that are really troubled, you're heavy, decisions, weight, things looming in your heart and life that, that are just heavy, man, just heavy. Nothing wrong with that. What's wrong is when we treat them like Elijah did, and that is to wallow in them and not take them totally to the Lord. Let me ask a question. I want to ask a question to every person in here. Save will answer it one way. Loss will answer it another, but the same question to, to, to both categories. How do you grapple and handle the fact that the God who loves you and the God who is wooing you and the God who is caring for you, how do you contend with the fact that the God that you know wants you surrendered his all to you when we have still yet to surrender our all to Him. It's our move. If you've never been born again, never been saved, today, this March the 26th, can be the day that you go into the kingdom. You can leave from here where your burden's been lifted at Calvary. So I'm positive there's one or two people here that need to get saved and to get born again. I'll be here. Lots of our encouragers will be here. They're already making their way to the front even now. And their wives will help you, dear ladies, if you need some help. So I promise you, we have got incredible, gifted men and women of God that can help you in whatever situation you happen to be in. 
But then there's probably a lot of folks who just have a heavy heart. You're in that Proverbs 12, 25 verse. Anxiety in my heart has brought depression. And I'm praying that the word you've heard today has been a good word and it'll make your heart glad. So in just a second, in just a moment, we're going to stand. And here's my prayer. I'll be here. These gentlemen will be here just willing and ready to help and assist you and encourage you. This altar is open for you to bring your burdens to and to leave them here and not pick them up and take them back to your seat, your car, your home. And allow the Lord Jesus to give you freedom to find his hope, his peace, his name and all that you face, all that you do. Because he can, he can, he can free you of that. And maybe you know that somebody else in the building is hurting. You knew that yesterday, you knew that this morning. And maybe you just want to be God's encourager. Maybe you want to be Mr. and Ms. Barnabas. And go and seek out the person or the persons or individuals that you know has a heavy heart. And you just want to put your arms around them or touch them, grab them on the hands and shoulders, and just take them to Jesus. Whether, you, whether you're going to be saved, whether you're going to come and bring your burdens here or going to go to somebody, I'm going to ask you, whatever you're going to do, I'm going to ask you to let's do it and let's do it quickly. Let's be the encouragers. Let's be obedient to what the Lord's put in your heart to do. Maybe you're here today to join this church. And I'll be here to help you with that. So are these men as well. So, Father, I've taught, preached, spoke, shared the message as best I know how. And uh, I've honestly poured my heart out over it to ask you to help me do it. Not just help me, but to take control of it. So I'll leave it with you. It's yours. It's your, it's your word. It never was mine. I just got it from you. So I thank you for it. So I pray now that you would allow fruit to remain, make conviction be so strong no one could stay seated if they need to come to this altar for whatever reasons this morning. I ask it all in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand. You be moving. You be, you be obedient to what the Lord's asked you to do. And as we sing this song this morning, Brother Chuck, if you would.